All right, so we are going to do Unit 3, Lecture 3, uh, still on the topic of nuclear chemistry. Um, we are going to switch focus to um, nuclear, what's going on nuclear-wise on kind of a big scale. And you'll see what I mean by big scale here in just a second. But uh, First of all, I would uh, recommend, although it is not required, uh, won't be testing your notes on this, there is a crash course video, right? Uh, maybe when I upload this to YouTube, I will be smart enough to figure out how to make a link to this, this little video here. But it is a crash course video at this web address uh, that does kind of go through with more animation type stuff, the, the processes of nuclear fusion and fission and so on. Um, not to substitute my lecture necessarily, but just to supplement it. All right. Anyways, so nuclear energy. What are we actually talking about when we say nuclear energy? So, um, kind of on the, the esoteric level, understanding what actually goes on when we talk about nuclear energy, uh, is essentially we have to understand that matter and energy are actually interchangeable. So if you go back to that idea of conservation of mass uh, principle, well, we could probably more accurately call that the conservation of mass and energy, uh, because we can, in actuality, convert actual matter into pure energy all right uh, and that's essentially what happens when we when we do uh, nuclear reactions there's there's a conversion some of the mass some of the actual particles that make up that nucleus are actually converted into pure energy all right so it's not that the matter is going away it's being converted into energy all right um, so nuclei are held together by what we call binding energy um, and interestingly, if we were to take the total sum of mass of all the nucleons, right, we would get a total sum that is larger than the actual mass of a nucleus. All right, and the reason for that is some of that matter or mass is actually being converted into the energy uh, that is needed to hold that nucleus together. And that's what we call binding energy. All right, so some of the actual mass within those nucleons, the protons and neutrons, is converted to energy. All right, uh, and so when nucleons are removed or during nuclear fission or fusion, which we'll get to in just a second, uh, that conversion of matter into energy is how we call that nuclear energy that you've probably heard of. All right, so first of all, um, fission. All right, so we essentially have nuclear energy coming in two forms that we, we make use of, fission and fusion. Fission is the first one, all right? So fission is the process by which we take large atoms, all right, and break them apart, releasing immense amounts of energy uh, compared to how much material we have. So in a typical fission reactor, right, one of the types that we use to power our nuclear power plants, right? We take a large atom like uranium and we bombard it with a neutron. Oops. All right, and in doing so, that uranium atom splits apart. That's what we see shown right here, okay? Uh, releasing neutrons. Now, in the splitting apart of that atom, we are converting some of the mass in that atom into pure energy, all right? Now, when that splits apart, it releases more neutrons. Those other neutrons can then go out and split another uranium atom or two other or three other uranium atoms, causing this sort of uh, what they call chain reaction, right? We split that, that splits apart, releases more energy, releases more neutrons, and eventually, you know, we can start splitting lots and lots of these atoms. And that's that chain reaction um, referred to as a nuclear chain reaction or a fission chain reaction. All right. So again, fission is where we take a big atom, and only certain atoms are fissible, by the way. A big atom like uranium-235, we split it apart by bombarding it with neutrons. When we split it apart, energy is released in the form of heat. We also release some neutrons, which can then split more uranium atoms, which can release more heat. Uh, that actually grows at an exponential rate uh, to produce lots of heat which we can then use to produce uh, power, which I'll show you how we do that here in just a second. Okay, but that's the process of fission. All right, so um, we use the immense amount of heat generated in a nuclear reaction. Heat boils water to produce steam. 
All right, so this is basically uh, how most of the power, like nearly um, uh, probably like 80 plus percent of the power in the U.S. is produced using this process, steps one through four. What varies is what we're using to produce the heat. So in a nuclear power plant, we're using the fission process to produce heat. That heat is then used to boil water to produce steam, right? The steam under high pressure spins a turbine. A turbine is essentially a fancy name for a wheel, right? That wheel spins a generator. That generator feeds electricity out through wires, right? Through some sort of conductor, all right? And that eventually makes its way into your house to turn on light bulbs or power your TV or recharge your phone, etc. Nuclear power is one of the ways we generate that electricity, all right? Now, in the U.S., it's a about 20% of our power. 33% um, comes from coal. About 33% is natural gas. All right. And about 20% is nuclear. It's like 6% is hydro. And then everything else, you know, solar, wind, whatever else. Okay. Uh, vast majority, of course, is coal and natural gas. Nuclear comes in at number three, hydro comes in at number four in terms of how much electricity we produce. Now around here, you should all know, of course, living in the Pacific Northwest, where does most of our electrons uh, get produced? That, would, of course, would be hydropower around here. All right? Um, now, interesting thing, okay, about um, nuclear power. And just to kind of put this in scale for you. Um, produce large amounts of electricity using very small amounts of fuel. So when I say this, I want you to, again, try to get an, uh, an idea of scale. So a kilogram of uranium, which is our typical nuclear fuel, so one kilogram would be equal to 14,000 kilograms of coal. All right, so one kilogram of uranium fuel is equal to 14,000 kilograms of coal. So we're talking a huge difference. So again, we're talking the difference between a gallon of gasoline and a nuclear weapons worth of um, uh, energy, okay? So when I say large amounts of electricity using the very small amounts of fuel, I mean large, large amounts of electricity using a crazy small amount of fuel, okay? Uh, so, yeah, that's on the pros list. Produces uh, um, various, you need a very small amount of fuel compared to coal, okay? So it's on about 14,000 times less fuel is needed to produce the same amount of electricity. Big difference, all right? Um, now, also, because we're not burning something with the, the fission process, we're not catching things on fire and releasing pollutants into the air. It is very, very contained. So essentially, little to no air pollution is associated with nuclear power, all right? Uh, which, you know, with our coal fire power plants and natural gas, um, we actually are pretty good at controlling the pollutants, but um, there's also no carbon emissions, um, which is really important to uh, stability of our atmosphere and uh, the way we uh, sunlight enters and leaves, okay? Uh, it's also because we can use various types of nuclear fuels, things like thorium, for example, uh, likely to last much longer than fossil fuels. Um, and like fossil fuels, it's available 24-7. So, you know, things like wind and solar, which are variable in their capacity depending on the day, uh, the time of day, uh, nuclear power is similar to the things like coal and natural gas, where we can use it 24-7. doesn't matter if it's windy, doesn't matter if the sun's out. All right, so you guys may be thinking, well, that's a lot of pros on the nuclear power side, right? So what's wrong with this stuff? Well, there are some issues. I'm not necessarily making it wrong, per se, but things that uh, maybe don't work in its favor in terms of moving more and more toward it. All right, now, we do have to use large amounts of water, and this is actually true for uh, any power plant uh, other than things like solar and wind, mind you. All right, um, and that water isn't necessarily becoming reactive or radioactive. Okay, this is water that's not directly exposed to radiation. It's just water that gets heated up. All right, uh, and that water, as it works its way back out in nature again, uh, it's not polluted per se, 
uh, it is heated up, but that when hot water holds less oxygen, that's bad for fishies. All right. Um, now, we also produce radioactive waste. Okay, and the the waste pellets. So they call them spent fuel rods and anything else that get exposed to high ionizing radiation. Um, we have to store it somewhere. Okay, because it's dangerous. We can't just put it out in nature. We can't throw it in a landfill like other types of waste because it's highly, highly dangerous. Okay, um, the trouble with it is not only is it dangerous, it's going to remain dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. All right, uh, which by our standards, your standards, my standards, may as well be forever. So we have stuff that's not just dangerous, but it's going to remain dangerous essentially forever. Uh, which makes it that much more important to find good long-term storage. Okay? Uh, now, if you guys have followed the news in recent history, you might have heard about Fukushima, right? So following the, the great big tsunami that hit Japan, as if that wasn't enough, the tsunami took out a nuclear power plant um, and exposed the surrounding area to high, high levels of nasty radiation. Now, not nearly as bad as the accident in Chernobyl where they essentially had to evacuate and all kinds of uh, radiation-associated illnesses came out, uh, including uh, in the neighborhood of tens of thousands of deaths. Uh, but accidents can happen at these plants. And when accidents do happen, even though they're extremely rare, uh, they're bad, bad news. It just takes one accident to make it really not worth it. Um, now, worth saying, there are prototypes out um, and next generation type reactors that eliminate almost entirely the risk of those accidents. So there are ways of producing nuclear power in a safe and relatively environmentally friendly way. Okay? Uh, it's just that those accidents, when they do happen, are nasty, nasty business. All right? So fission, last time, that's what we use for nuclear power to power things like our nuclear power plants, also our nuclear subs and aircraft carriers, all right? That's big atoms being split apart. When we split apart those big atoms, it releases energy in the form of heat. We use that heat to boil water, to create steam, which makes a turbine, which powers the generator, which makes electricity, all right? Now, uh, the next type of nuclear power that we don't use for electricity, by the way, is fusion, all right? So fusion um, is taking the small atoms, like hydrogen, all right? So this shows, uh, two different isotopes of hydrogen being fused together to create something like helium, okay? Um, in the process of fusion, much like fission, when we fuse two atoms together, we release lots and lots of energy, okay? Um, and so similar to uh, fission power, we're talking small amount of uh, matter creates a lot of energy. And uh, where we actually see fusion ongoing, of course, is places like stars. Our sun is a giant uh, thermonuclear reaction, uh, in which case mostly hydrogen is being fused into helium. All right? Uh, and all that energy, which you have to remember about the sun, is it's not on fire. Okay? The sun is fusing. It's releasing energy in the form of all kinds of electromagnetic radiation. But the sun is not on fire. Okay? Um, now, if we could make fusion work on the power scale in terms of making electricity, um, we would probably solve all of our energy problems, right? What's our byproduct here when we run fusion? Our byproduct is helium, right? Which is an inert, extremely safe uh, gas, non-reactive, okay? So remember one of the cons with fission was the fact that we produced this harmful radioactive waste and we have these chances for accidents. With fusion, if we can make the process work, uh, an accident wouldn't result in any sort of radiation leak, right? It might be an explosion, which would be bad news, but it would not result in the catastrophic damage to the surrounding environment that would last for years and years. We don't have waste, right? We can use helium uh, for lots of industrial purposes, um, and we can produce enough energy to power us for essentially indefinitely, right? So this would solve all of our issues with energy we could just get fusion to work on the scale needed for electricity production. All right? Um, it's not that we can't cause fusion to happen. It's just that we, we can't really get a net positive out of energy 
or we get a gigantic explosion uh, out of the deal. Um, so something's still to be worked out. They've been working on it for a while, and research is still going into it. All right. Now, of course, the dark side of nuclear power is uh, nuclear weapons. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can use either fission or fusion for nuclear weapons. Right. So fission bombs uh, using either plutonium or uranium. Right. Are what we used back in World War II. Uh, so Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two bombs we dropped uh, during World War II, were fission bombs. All right. Uh, we have since develop what are called fusion bombs uh, or thermo thermonuclear weapons uh, which we actually use the fission bomb to detonate a fusion bomb um, and those have only been tested so we, we have uh, thermonuclear warheads and we tested them uh, detonated them over uninhabited areas but they do not uh, never used one as an act of war now uh, so with nuclear weapons, that, that technology is out there. There are several countries with technology, the uh, U.S. being one of them. There are several countries we really, really worry about getting the technology. Uh, now, right or wrong in Japan, I'm not going to debate that with you guys. That's an interesting discussion. Um, it's not really within the purview of chemistry. Um, but it is worth pointing out, you know, we worry about all these other countries and terrorists and so on getting a hold of nuclear weapons. Only one country has ever actually used a nuclear weapon uh, on another country. And guess who that is? That would be us here in the U.S., right? So uh, something to consider. You know, we're, we don't generally worry about us using nuclear weapons on ourselves, right? Uh, but, you know, in the whole worry about who has nuclear weapons, it's important to remember we are the only country that's ever actually used one. All right. Um, now, fission bomb versus fusion bomb. You guys got a, a little glimpse of that just a second ago. But understanding just how far the technology in nuclear weapons has come since Hiroshima. Right. So if we could zoom in on this little part right here. Right. That would be Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Two very, very uh, small nuclear weapons in comparison to what we actually have uh, at our fingertips now. Just to press of a couple buttons away which is really really scary so look at this right so that's Hiroshima okay that small little cloud right there all right now this is the largest uh, nuclear weapon ever tested it's called Tsar Bomba uh, the Soviet Union tested it it is a fusion bomb okay um, and the scale or the order of magnitude larger that bomb is compared to Hiroshima is kind of mind-boggling all right. Uh, with Sar Bomba, a weapon of that size, everything within a 15 mile radius. Right. So if a bomb went off, there'd be a stretch of 30 miles uh, where everything gets demolished. So something to think about that we'll follow up on tomorrow. All right. So make sure you guys walk in with these notes. There will be a quiz.